So today's topics, do we, do we have a couple of things? Should we discuss that too? Is it Suvitai has something, Alex has something, uh, and so. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I guess we'll do Charmaine's questions. I can do my paper and, um, and Alex can do his, I guess. Uh, first thing first is that the NICE workshops keynote is out, so it's already on the website. So if you guys want to check out the recording, it's right here. The videos and the slides is all on our website for the NICE keynote. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah, it just came out this morning, the video. So, Yeah, so there is a question. I think this is probably for Alex on his uh, research meeting in early March. And it basically is about what about a, um, yeah, applicable dendrites that receive backward propagation information. Yeah, um, so this, I'm sorry, I don't have a reference for you, um, but I remember seeing there is some work that does exactly this, um, where they have the neuron model incorporates the backward feedback as a separate path through like separate dendrites. I forgot who did it. It might have been um, something related to difference target propagation. Um, but yeah, th this, uh, this, this approach, um, has been tried by by some people to varying degrees. Hey, hey, hey Alex. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Alex. Uh, one of the papers I know is um, uh, it's called "Towards Deep Learning with Segregated Dendrites" by uh, Gorgiev, uh, Lillicrap, and Richards uh, back in 2017. Elife. So that's one possible. I, I probably butchered the first name there, but uh, yeah, uh, that's one one paper I know of that's in this, uh, that explicitly looks at incorporating apical dendrites uh, for receiving back, back prop information. Yeah, I would say, yeah, it, that name Lily Crab comes up a lot in, in this kind of stuff. Um, so for anybody who's interested in learning more, that's a good place to start. Just start by looking at Lily Crab's um, previous work. Okay, sounds good, thank you. And then the next question is about grid cell coordination. I'll give everyone some time to kind of read it. Marcus, do you understand uh, is, the questions? Is, is sure. this the, yeah, is this is this part of a larger thread or is this the first message in it? It looks this like this is the first. first message. Okay. So it's not really like it's not really based on knowledge of grid cells. It's not about grid cell literature. It's about the theory of grid cells and cortical columns and how they would work. So it's like it's speculation. So in some ways, this is a Jeff question. Um I, in my in my time looking at this question, the past thirty seconds, I, I don't understand it well enough to give a good answer. Yeah, I'm not sure I really understand the questions. I'm not sure what he means by why is that group of cells way over there responding in lockstep to what is happening locally. I, I don't understand that question. I don't know if you do, Marcus. Um, not really, not right now. If I stared at it for longer, I might be able to decode it, but it, it's not. It's 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 too much. It's it's too much about like you know expect speculation on how grid cells might be part of cort cortical columns, which that's just a big topic. There's a lot of ways yeah. of framing that. And uh, and I have to like adopt the mindset of this question and I, this isn't enough. <laughs> I can't do it in this time span. Yeah, it, I think, it, yeah, yeah, something like that might help to send the questions ahead of time and then we could answer it. Yeah, um, that's what I was gonna yeah, suggest. Probably alive. next time I'll probably send it like a day before and I'll just send like a yeah. link of questions and you guys can look over it and then we can go over it. Yeah, we can still go over it live. I don't know if there's a misunderstanding here. Was it, is it, I'm not sure what why things would be really far away. At least in the cortical column model, the grid cells are located, you know, let's say in the lower layers. Again, that's what we've kind of proposed in the past. 
and they're in relatively close proximity to the sensory input that's maybe in higher layers. And there's lots of you know connections back and forth between the layers. It's, it's not like their grid cells are in some really distant part of the brain and the sensory input is in a completely different part of the brain and there's no way that communication could get from one place to another. Um, so I'm wondering if there, the assumptions behind this are some, if there's some misunderstanding or at least I'm not understanding the intent of this question correctly. And in terms of the hierarchical topology, I think the, the topology is very clear in the lower la layers of the hierarchy, but as you get higher and higher up, there's less and less topology and it's, things tend to be much coarser and, and the, the cells respond globally to uh, a lot of different uh, types of input. So as you go from, you know, even in, you know, from V1 up, uh, you know, you have very clear topology at the lower levels, but at IT, there's almost, there's very little topology. Each area corresponds to a very large part of the visual space. Um, and uh, once you get even up to parietal areas, there's almost no topology as far as I know. So the, I think that, so yeah, so some of the, maybe, maybe Bitkin uh, can listen to this and maybe, uh, Ask some, uh, knowing at least my misunderstandings about this question, maybe you can you can phrase it differently. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. That's all the questions for this week. But then next time, I'll just collect the questions and send it to you guys beforehand, so you guys can kind of digest it before taking a stab at it. Yeah, probably particularly with those like long, complex ones. Uh, yeah, that would, that would be good. Yeah, the, the first one was pretty straightforward, and that, that was that was great. I think this 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 is a good format. I, this would be very quick and easy for us to respond to the HTM uh, community. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess I can go next. Um, I'm going to be discussing a paper. Um, Hold on. Uh, yeah, it's called alleviating catastrophic forgetting using context dependent gating and synaptic stabilization. So I'll show the paper in a second. Um, what I thought I would do first is maybe share uh, a little bit of context for why I was interested in the paper. Um, can you guys see this PowerPoint slide? Um, so this was um, kind of a background. I think a lot of people are already know this, but you know, in HTMs, we did continuous learning with, with sparse representations. And this is a slide from a, a presentation I made late last year, I think, where we reviewed a whole bunch of papers on supermass and meta-learning and OML and so on. And I made the point there that when we think about continuous learning in HTMs, we don't really uh, use language of gating and, and context we didn't really use it as much in the paper, but that's really what's going on in, in uh, let's say, in the HTM sequence memory. And when we have these figures up top, maybe what's not apparent is that the network itself contains significant recurrent connections within, within each layer. So this is the same layer at different points in time for those of you who don't know it. But if you look at a particular, if you look at a layer, there's significant recurrent connections back and forth in, into the distal dendrites. Uh, and then what happens is that the dendrites and, and well, for e any given task, which might be a specific sequence, you have a very sparse subnetwork that's specific to that task. If you go through a particular sequence like ABC, there's a very specific subset of the connections and the subset of the cells that become active. And what's going on is that it's the dendrites that are essentially choose which subnetwork to instantiate at any given point. So when you have some quote unquote context, um, which in the temporal memory was the activity of the cells in the previous time step. That was the context that the dendrites would recognize that context and using a winner take all mechanism or other mechanisms would, would select a particular sub network that's specific to that task. And then all the representations are extremely high dimensional and very sparse. And this allows you to uh, avoid you know, significant overlap between tasks and there. So this is, so even in our kind of sequence memory, the way we did, we're able to do continuous learning 
we had all of these uh, connections there. And then based on context, the dendrites would choose specific subnetworks to instantiate. Um, and so the part of what we've been doing over the last few months is trying to see, okay, we did this in HCM, we sh showed it working in practical scenarios. Can we take these ideas and incorporate them into deep learning? Um, and so I'm not gonna talk about that work on dendrites right now, but the paper that I will show is, is very much in this spirit. Um, and uh, I thought it's a, it's a really well-written paper um, and very clearly written. And I think it's, it's worth reviewing just so we're all familiar with it and, and some of these content, concepts. So, uh, so I'm gonna, so that, yeah. I don't know if you're gonna yeah. talk about that, but you just mentioned something that, um, yeah, it let me think. In. So in our current dendrites implementation, the dendrites don't have recurrent connections between them, right? Is that different from HTM and are we taking a step towards that at some point? Yeah, so the, it's, in the, it's in the HTM um, because the HTM was doing temporal sequences. And what happened is that you would use the previous activity as the context for the current activity. Um, but in other situations, uh, it doesn't have to be recurrently connected. Um, the context signal could come from elsewhere. Um, so if you think if our, in our columns paper and the columns plus paper, for example, we use the exact same dendritic mechanisms, but there were no recurrent connections at all. The context was coming from uh, a location signal in that case, like grid cell representations. So there's nothing inherent. You know, the fact that it's recurrent is purely the, the, the fact that it was dealing with sequences and streaming data. The mechanism doesn't rely on recurrence. Right, but, but the recurrence in HTM is, is not just uh, because of the time steps. You also have lateral connections between dendrites, right? And those lateral connections we don't have in our current model. Yeah, but those, the, the, those lateral connections, that's what I mean by these recurrent connections. Those lateral connections are there only in, this, in, the, temporal, in the sequence version of temporal memory. When we, okay. we could use that same mechanism with zero lateral connections, um, but the connections onto the dendrites are instead coming from the location signal and the whole thing still works. Okay, All right. Yeah, so it's just, it's more the, the fundamental idea is really the fact that we're using context of some sort to select subnetworks that are gonna be instantiated and these subnetworks are extremely sparse to avoid overlap. That, that's really the core of the idea. And then you could say, okay, what is the right context signal? Um, and if it's the previous activity, then you end up with recurrent connections here onto the dendrites. That, that's what gets you the con context from the past. And if okay. it's location is the context, then, then you don't need that lateral connection. So the context could just come from some other layer. And so it could be anything that has the context. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to try presenting from my iPad now, because that's where I wrote the notes for a lot of the papers. So let me see if this works. I did this pat in the past, and it's, it's always a little bit awkward to get going, but hopefully. Uh, can you guys see? Yeah, I might turn off my camera because I'll otherwise I'll always be looking down and I feel like that looks really weird on the <laughs> on Zoom. So I might turn off the camera for a bit. Okay, so this is a, a paper we published a while ago in 2016 that specifically talks about continuous learning with these sparse uh, networks. Although the language, again, is not the one I just used. It's a different language that's used in here. That's why I wanted to talk about it. Okay, so let's get to the paper itself. Um, Okay, so this is the paper um, that I wanted to talk about. And uh, you can now see why this name, <laughs> paper name caught my attention. So it's kind of funny, the way I found out about this paper is I use Mendeley to keep track of my papers and, and to read my papers and they have, so they know what papers I'm reading and they have a email that gets sent out every week or so that they suggest new papers to read based on what you've been reading. Um, and I've often found really good papers through that. It's a pretty interesting kind of service. And so this came up in my feed a couple of weeks ago. I think I posted on Slack and then Karan looked at it and, um, 
and he and I talked about it. And then as he talked about it with me, it, it became clear that it's, it's a really interesting paper. And, and so I, I spent uh, you know, time reading it. And so I have to say, this is, it's a very well-written paper. Um, it's like really clearly written. The, the hypotheses are very clear and uh, they go through it step by step. And as I'm reading it, it's like, I have questions about, oh, what about this? And then, you know, lo and behold, the next paragraph would talk about exactly that thing. So I felt for me anyway, it was reading it. It was a very kind of logically, uh, logical paper and, and very clearly written. So I, I really like that part of it. Um, so this appeared in PNAS, uh, Proceeding of the National, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And let me just highlight uh, first the, uh, the abstract. You can see this um, highlighted area here. Um, and then you can see, I'll just read that part. It says here, drawing inspiration from algorithms that are believed to be implemented in vivo. By in vivo, they just mean in brains running live in vivo. We propose a complementary method, adding a context-dependent gating signal such that only sparse, mostly non-overlapping patterns of units are active for any one task. So the core of what they're looking at is very similar to what I what I just described, and they test different aspects of this um, and, and they show how it impacts continual learning. Uh, the other piece that they do is um, they include something called synaptic stabilization. So this is basically elastic weight consolidation or synaptic intelligence. They're two methods that we've discussed in the past. I'm not gonna, I'm not planning on going into those in much detail. I think we've done a journal club of that. Uh, I forget if it was Quran or Lucas or someone did a, Journal Club on that uh, a while ago. But they're basically looking at combining these two things for uh, continuous learning. Um, yeah, so they have some nice references to dendrites and dendritic spines and stuff on the, on the left there. Um, so they make the point that, you know, animals are gonna in encounter large numbers, um, you know, hundreds of tasks um, and in, and you have to remember these tasks and environments. And, and we all know about the catastrophic forgetting problem. If you just do backprop and learn things in sequence, you tend to forget previous tasks very quickly. Um, and the issue, so synaptic stabilization has been shown to help in this. If you do elastic weight consolidation or synaptic intelligence, then you can alleviate some of the problems of catastrophic forgetting. And very briefly, what happens with those two methods is that any given synapse tries to kind of handle multiple tasks well. Um, so their insight was with backprop, if you learn on a new task, then there's nothing preventing the weight from moving completely away from the old tasks, right? So you can, if you learn on, a, on task one, and the weights become adjusted to task one, now you don't see anything more from task one and you go to task two, then when you're learning task two, the weights, the way backprop works, it's just gonna to try to minimize task two, the loss for task two, so the weights can move completely away from what's good for task one. And in EWC and synaptic intelligence, they try to have synapses that are good for kind of multiple tasks at a time, um, or if it's really, already well-tuned to a task, they won't move those weights as much. And they'll try to use other weights um, that are not as important for that task. So there's a, a couple of different ways of, of doing it. And, and you can already see what the issue might be that, well, you know, as you have more and more tasks, you can't have a, the same weight sort of serving too many different masters, right? It's, and so that's what they mean by this statement here. It is uncertain whether synaptic stabilization alone can support continual learning across large numbers of tasks. So it's gonna be really hard for you get to hundreds of tasks or thousands of tasks for a single synapse to really serve well across all of these tasks. Okay. So their proposal is to do something called context dependent gating. Um, so that's, that's here. Um, and the idea here is they're gonna invoke subnetworks and then only the synapses or weights within that subnetwork have to learn uh, 
different tasks. So if you have completely non-overlapping subnetworks, then, and you have, let's say you have 10 subnetworks and 100 tasks, then any subnetwork only has to really learn 10 tasks. Right? That's the basic uh, kind of thing, the hypothesis that they're looking at. Okay, so let me show you the networks that they try. Um, and they're very kind of systematic in trying, in all of their experiments, they try all of these different things. Uh, so they really try five different types of things. So first is just plain backprop. So here, um, so this figure A here actually shows two different networks here. Um, so their basic network has um, for, you know, first they're gonna look on at MNIST and for mutation MNIST. So they have 784 inputs, two hidden layers with 2000 inputs each, and then 10 outputs for the 10 classes. Okay. This is sort of remarkably similar to the numbers that we're using in our dendrite networks uh, where, and the numbers that we use in, uh, in HTM in terms of the number of uh, mini columns. You know, we have 2048 in our old HTM things. Um, and I think Quran and, and in our dendrite networks, we're also using 2048. So this is remarkably <laughs> similar in terms of numbers. Um, so they, that's the basic network they use. And then they train it with basic backprop. Um, and they can also train it with uh, these synaptic stabilization methods uh, that, I, that I discussed. Okay, so that's two situations. Then they say, okay, what if the network had some context which told you what the task was? Okay, so that's, um, oops, um, so that's sort of this B here. Um, this network is given a one hot encoded uh, signal, this, this thing here, which encodes the task ID, and it's just fed in, and there's a layer of weights here. So it's just another input into the hidden layers. So each of the hidden layers get the input and raw input and it also gets the, the task ID as input. And it can just learn those. Okay, so uh, that's, the, that's a scenario um, that they test. What if you just given the context signal as another input and you just treat that as a feed forward system. And then in network, in panel C, what you see is um, what if you had completely distinct sub networks for each task ID. Okay, so let's say here, um, this is an example that shows, uh, you know, five, five tasks. Um, so let's say you had a one hot encoded vector that, that had five different components. And then for each task, it's going to only allow a specific subnetwork to become active. So that would be, you know, like here, right? So for this particular task, only those activities would be allowed to propagate. Everything else would be uh, set to zero. Okay, so you have completely distinct non-overlapping networks. So this is what they call the split network scenario. And then in panel D, um, well, erase this stuff. Uh, so in panel D, um, they have what they call context-dependent gating. And here you have, um, again, you have your one hot encoded uh, input specifying the task. You have your regular input. And for each task here, um, you have a specific subset, a random subset of the hidden units that are, that are uh, allowed to propagate. Okay, so what happens is that for each task ID, you have a, a, what they do is they do gating. So for each task ID, they have, let's say 80% of the units here will be multiplied by zero. Um, and the others will be multiplied by one, the activations and allowed to propagate. Okay, are those scenarios clear? In scenario B, are they back propagating through the context network? In scenario B? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are weights here. So, okay, cool. uh, and you know, and there are weights everywhere here. So they're back propagating through the whole thing. And in okay. B and D, there's no, uh, there's no weights in the, 
I'm sorry, in C and D, there's no weights associated with the context signal. Right, right. Yeah, it's just used to select which units become uh, active. Um, and this is also very similar to what Quran tried. So in, the, in, in C, it's uh, his original hard-coded thing had very distinct subnetworks that were not overlapping, whereas in D, uh, two different, you know, you can have overlapping subnetworks. So a given task, um, you know, so maybe for task, uh, you know, for this task, these three networks, these three units are allowed to become active, right? But it may be for this task, you have this, this, these guys become active. And so this unit would be shared across the two tasks. Is, is the, uh, when you say that they're random, uh, are they statically set random or are they, uh, they learned and uh, there's some subset that's allowed to uh, uh, emerge uh, as, uh, with your 80% uh, sparsity? Yeah, no, that it's completely static. It's set up front. So there's no okay. learning associated with which, you know, with the mask associated with the with each context. So that's yeah. definitely one of the you know issues with, with the paper. Yeah, and it could you know, with our Denrights work, we learned which subset would, would become active, but here it's hard coded up front. Okay, so those are the different scenarios. Um, and so, let me see. Um, yeah, so, so the, um, the first result is that um, if you just do standard backcrop um, and you train on tasks sequentially on, on permutation MNIST, then uh, after 100 tasks, you get to about 19.1%. Right. Maybe I'll just switch to the, the charts. Yeah, that might be easy. Oh, okay, yeah, they don't have a chart on that, sorry. Yeah, so it, it, the baseline is that standard backprop without anything special gets to 19.1% after 100 permutations. So that's sort of expected. It's catastrophically forgetting all of the other uh, permutations. Um, so here's the different... Uh, you can see the figures here with the different results. So um, if you look at uh, panel A, they try both EWC and synaptic intelligence on going up to 100 tasks. And so EWC gets up to somewhere around, I don't know, like 72% after 100 tasks. And synaptic intelligence is better. It's like, I don't know, like 83% or something like that here. Um, so it's significantly better than the baseline of 19% for standard backprop. Um, so that's that. So that's good. That's I think replicating previous results. Then if you look at uh, panel B here, um, the dotted lines show what happens if you add that context signal as input into the network. So you're still doing you know, the, the synaptic stabilization thing. So you still have either EWC plus context or synaptic intelligence plus context. And you can see that, um, you know, the accuracy is improved if you add the task ID as, as a feed forward input into the, into the system. Okay. And that with synaptic intelligence plus the context signal, you get to roughly 90% accuracy. Okay. Is that pretty clear? Um, and then panels C, what, what is panel C? Um, oh, panel C is, okay, now suppose you have uh, the split networks. Okay, so every task ID would have a completely distinct subset of the networks, network uh, active. And then you, um, and you have all of these various co combinations you can have. Uh, Oh, okay, so EWC plus context. So the, the green dashed line here, I think is the same as this green dashed line here. And this purple one will be the same as here. Right? So they're just, re, they're just showing that same thing again. Um, and then if you split the subnet into subnetworks, you see a slight increase in accuracy. So if you look at uh, 
you know, split synaptic intelligence plus context, um, it gets, you know, maybe like 93% or something like that. Okay, so it's, it's uh, having the context signal and having split net networks help. Um, okay, the and then having the split uh, networks and a context signal, because isn't one of them good enough to tell you which task it is? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess uh, that's right. I think split assumes you know the context. <laughs> yeah, the context is used to split it up. Okay. So I think that's pretty, it's a little bit redundant if you say split SI plus context, you could just as well just say split SI. Yeah, I think uh, that's right. And, and in that case, it's non-overlapping, right? The the solid lines in panel C, the, the, the subnetworks are non-overlapping. They're non-overlapping, exactly. Um, and then the last one, panel D, is shows um, what they call their context-dependent gating stuff here. Uh, and that's where for each task ID, you choose a random subset of the networks of the network to become active and you allow overlap in there. Um, and that's where they got the best results that's here. So they get up to about 95, what did they say here? 95.4%, uh, that's what they, so. Could you uh, pull you back to panel, panel C for a second? Uh, so from what Karan was saying uh, is there, there's, there's no need to play with the granularity of the splitting that the, the context really, uh, the number of tasks really dictates the degree of splittedness or is, is there some room for playing with that? Uh, there probably is some room for playing. It's sort of similar to what you were asking earlier about learning which learning the mask with it for each context. Uh, the, uh, you know, um, probably it'll be a little bit better in the, here the, it's just, they just did it brute force. They just split it evenly. And, but I mean, and did they to, try different, two no. different levels of splitting or is it, there's no. just one that really kind of stands out? There's just, okay. they, they just split it evenly. Um, they didn't really okay. try different variations of that. Um, in, in all, you know, with permitted MNIST, the tasks are so similar that there may not be much advantage in, in tweaking that. So maybe that's why they didn't do it because each task is basically identical to, to the previous task. Okay. With, with, per, with permuted MNIST, I mean. Um, so this panel D is kind of interesting. So, so clearly with allowing overlapping subnetworks, they got the best result. So that's good. Um, these, these two lines here are the same as these two. So they're just showing the, you know, the impact of synaptic intelligence in EWC on its own. What's really weird to me is, is the black solid line. So that is just doing context dependent gating without any synaptic stabilization, but allowing redundant redundancy. And you can see it does pretty poorly. Um, I mean, still way better than backprop on its own, but whoops. Uh, you know, it gets up to, I don't know, 62, 63%, somewhere around there. So that was really bizarre to me. Like, uh, I would have thought the context dependent gating by itself would be, would be pretty good. Um, I mean, it's better than regular backprop, but it's, um, it's quite a bit worse than EWC or SI on its own. Uh, but somehow when you do you know, let's say synaptic intelligence plus context dependent gating, that gives you the, the very best results up here. Uh, so that was, that was kind of interesting. Uh, maybe if they had done some sort of learning of the masks, like you're suggesting, Kevin, maybe this, the black solid line could have been better. Um, you know, this, is, this black solid line is just with a random mapping of task ID to which neurons should be allowed to become active. I mean, it seems to me that without learning or some other uh, guidance, it would it would just be acting as noise. Well, no, it's not noise. Uh, it's still doing something because it's it's basically each task is activating a sub a subset of the network that has very minimal overlap with with everyone else with the other sub networks. Right, but in so, the sense, like it almost looks like a like a dropout layer. No, 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 it's very different from dropout. 
No, no, it's very different from dropout. Um, uh, so well, let's look at some of these numbers. Um, and and uh, I think the numbers are interesting. So what they did, what these charts show is gating 80% of the hidden units. So what that means is that their sparsity is 80%, that 80% of the hidden units are set to zero for a given task, okay? So, you know, for, so for task one, they're gonna choose a random 20% of the units to be on. For task two, it's gonna be another random 20% uh, of the units. And so you can look at the overlap be between the networks that are activated from one task compared to the other. And you can just use the SDR math to figure out exactly what the probability of overlap, of significant overlap is. And it's gonna be very small, right? So it's, you know, there are 2000, choose 20 possible subnetworks here. And, and so this is a really huge number. Um, and so you can see that, uh, you know, you, you, the chance of a significant overlap between any two subnetworks is gonna be small. So it's not, it's not okay. a noise as such. They're explicitly saying for task, you know, for task I, the subnetworks are gonna be very dissimilar to any other the subnetworks by any other task. They're still sharing. So a given unit is still involved in multiple tasks. But if you look at the entire act, set of active units, the, the overlap between one layer and the next is gonna be very low. Okay, yeah. That's kind of the I, essence I, I, of I the intuition. I, I, I perceive the difference of, of a dropout. It would just be, you know, it would be, there's no context dependent. So there would be, it's just, you know, that would be noise. But in this case, yeah, yeah, dropout the context is, is gating it. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Okay, it's a fix. I, I got the difference. Yeah. And the other thing, other you know, so dropout is ran completely random. It doesn't look at the input of the task at all. And of course, and the other thing is dropout is only used during learning. During inference, there is no dropout. Whereas here, it's learning right. and inference, it's the same. So it's, it's okay. quite a Compl pretty different from dropout. Yeah. Uh, what I found yeah, kind of interesting is, now. yeah, yeah. Uh, so I looked at their appendix um, where they actually tested the sparsities a little bit more. So they mentioned that briefly here that they tested different levels of sparsity. Uh, so I looked at their appendix, um, and what they have here is the accuracy. They look at the drop off in accuracy as a function of sparsity. So if you just do, if you just gate 50% of the units, you end up here, um, you know, so, you know, 50% sparsity, um, you know, still, still, you know, keep, keep, keep in mind that the access here is down to 90, it's a pretty, uh, it's scaled to 90, from 90% to 100%. So it's still pretty good. Uh, it's still well above, um, back proper, you know, even synaptic intelligence. But as you increase the sparsity, you know, this is increasing the sparsity, you know, your accuracy goes higher and higher. And you, the very best one, you know, the, these last two 80 and 87% were the highest. And you can see the area under the curve is a little bit higher for the 87%. So I don't know why they stopped at 87%. Um, I didn't see anything in the text that said that they tried higher percentages and or not. So that was a little bit curious to me. Like, why did they? Why didn't they keep going on this? Maybe anyway. if you have less less if you have less neurons left, you it's not enough neurons to classify anymore. Because you can see if you start at zero, it gets uh, worse, and the like the starting performance is better the more you have available, of course, to classify. But uh, it yeah. decreases very little, so I guess it could go on a bit at least. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. So the, I, I, I think that is that's going to be right. You know, as you get high, when you get too sparse, the accuracy is going to fall off. But given that it's kept increasing here, I think for this purpose of a paper, you would want to keep going and see where the fall off is. Right. So I would have liked to see a chart where you just look at the accuracy after a hundred tasks and maybe you look at, you know, sparsity here and, uh, you know, the accuracy here and, um, you know, maybe, maybe you get something like this, but eventually it should fall off here. Right? Um, so what is this point here? 
it's not clear to me that this is 87 percent <laughs> you know that would have been it would have been nice to see a chart something like that um, but are yeah. they using uh, relu in this uh that's a good question uh what have, i think it just had sigmoids oh um what is their base network um Sorry if this looks too. I'm guessing it's just sigmoid. They didn't. It says ReLU in Figure One, I think. Oh, it does. Yeah. Well, where do you see that? Uh, uh, on the first line, or oh, uh, yeah. describe it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right here. Great. Well, in that case, okay. Um, okay. In that case, going back to what you were saying earlier about the the eighty seven percent, that means that um, if they have two thousand hidden units in each layer, um, that's two hundred and sixty of them would be used for a particular subnetwork. And then if you have Relu, that means roughly one hundred and thirty are getting through. So, um, so that's. Well, I guess I don't know if that how that compares to tasks like Prometer Demnus, but um, that still seems pretty wide. They should be able to go past eighty seven percent. Yeah, yeah, and and I think what what Vivian said is probably correct. It, it probably drops off pretty fast after that, mm -hmm. but it would have been nice to have if they had explicitly tested that. Um, uh, okay, so what else? Um, Wait, so two seconds. Can nice. you go down back to the yeah. um, the curve that you drew? Uh, where is that? <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say here, if you have some point at which, um, you know, this above which the sparsity makes it just catastrophically drop off, um, you expect that also increasing the dimensionality would change that number for sparsity, right? So then uh, like 87% would absolutely. only be for this specific architecture with 2000 hidden units, um, but it would yes, be universal. Yes. Exactly. Um, and that, you know, I talked about the dimensionality stuff in a previous meeting, but yeah, this is as you increase the dimensionality, you should be able to increase the sparsity. And um, I think even the absolute number of units that are allowed to be on can decrease as you increase dimensionality. So it's not just the sparsity. Like, uh, you know, 90% sparsity with 2000 units is, uh, you know, 200 units active. With 4000 4, units, 90% sparsity is, you know, 400 units active. But with the dimensionality of 4,000, you might be able to get less than 200. You could go higher than 95% sparsity. You could mm -hmm. hopefully be able to get less than 200 absolute number of units on. Right. That's my that's my hypothesis. Okay. Um, so that's that's kind of their basic result. Um, they also tried it on ImageNet, which I'll explain in a second. Um, this, the second set of things they do, I, I'll go much more quickly. They, they try to see, okay, why is this the case? How come having this context dependent uh, networks, why is it so much better than just using, you know, let's say synaptic intelligence on its own, right? And what they looked at is you can look at how important each synapse is to, the, to the, all the tasks and you can plot the, uh, the importance and this importance comes out of this uh, synaptic intelligence loss function uh, pretty directly. Let me see if I can, you know, the, the synaptic intelligence stuff, uh, you know, you have your regular loss and then you add this other loss here where you look at the weights before and from the previous task and the current task and you compute this omega and uh, for each for each weight, and you use that to determine, you know, how much you, you update each weight, and so that omega is what they call their synapse importance, because okay, so it sort of comes directly out of the the synaptic intelligence stuff. Um, so they have a measure of how important a particular synapse is, and what they hypothesized is that you want to have a whole bunch of synapses that are not really that important so you can allocate to new tasks. Right? 
And so if, if every synapse is really important in the task you've already seen, then it's gonna be really hard to learn new things uh, without, without some loss in accuracy. And so they plotted, I think you could just look at panel C, it's probably the, the best one. Um, you know, they, they plotted uh, the, the histogram of the, how many synapses were important. So on the x-axis, uh, let me just get rid of this. Um, so on the x-axis here, you have the synapse importance and on the y-axis, how many synapses have that level of importance? So if you just use synaptic intelligence on its own, then, you know, you get, oops, you know, then you get this. Uh, but if you, once you use the context dependent gating, you end up with a whole bunch of synapses that have much lower importance. And so they're claiming that's one of the key things is that you have this kind of reserve, of, you know, reserve capacity of synapses that are, that can be now uh, used for, um, you know, learning a new task. And what synaptic intelligence on its own will do is when you're learning a new task, it's going to prefer to use these synapses. The ones that already have high importance, it's going to change very little uh, because it was important for previous tasks. So SI on its own is going to prefer this stuff on the, on the, on the left here. And so that's why they're saying synaptic intelligence plus context dependent gating is, allows you to get so much higher accuracy. That's their, the way they're. Uh, um, okay. Uh, then very quickly, I'll show the ImageNet results. Um, basically, they did a very uh, a, a, a smaller version of ImageNet. So they had ImageNet images that were downscaled to 32 by 32. So it's you know, presumably for speed things. And they split MNES into 100. From the 1,000 classes, they created 100 tasks. Each task had 10 different labels. Um, so they, they took, um, they just split up the thousand uh, classes into into hundred tasks of 10, 10 classes each. Um, and then they 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 tried two different architectures. One is a multi-headed architecture. So the multi-headed architecture had a thousand oops, uh, a thousand output units, and they you know, for each task, 10 of the output units were assigned to the category for that task. And so um, they would basically set 990 output units to zero at any, for any particular task and only allow the other 10 to, uh, to learn. Um, they created a baseline maximum accuracy you can get um, is about 56.5%. And that's if you essentially look at just train for each task, just train those 10 categories, look at the accuracy, then reset all the weights, train another uh, another task, look at the accuracy, reset the weights, train another task. And that will give you the kind of the maximum, oops, let me get rid of my notes here. That will give you the maximum possible accuracy on this network. And they found this that if you just do synaptic stabilization um, that gets you, um, so that the, the maximum accuracy is 56.5. And with just synaptic uh, uh, stabilization, you can get up to about 55%. So basically they concluded this was not a hard enough task. Um, and you know, SI on its own is able to solve this without catastrophic forgetting. So then they did a single head architecture, which is similar to what happened in permuted MNIST. So here the output unit only consists of 10 units. And so for any given task, the categories would be assigned, the 10 categories would be assigned to these 10 units. So any given unit has to learn, you know, 100 different categories really. Okay, so, uh, is, that, is that clear? And when they did that, that was a much harder task. Um, Um, you know, at that point, even EWC didn't work very well. They got to 12 or 13% accuracy in the single-headed architecture. 
And basically what they found is, so remember uh, the best you can, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. I, I didn't really catch the difference. Can you go back? But what is the difference between the simplest and the hardest test there? Okay, so the hard, the simple task is a multi-headed task. Um, so there you have your network. Oh, okay, okay, got it, got it, yeah. Yeah, and you have, you know, one head for each task. Okay, and remember you have 100 tasks, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the mul that's what they call the multi-headed architecture. And then for the, the single-headed architecture, you just have one, you know, one output layer and use that same output layer for every single task. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So before each head, uh, each unit in each head just learned one category. Here, each unit is learning a hundred categories, but in sequence. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Mike. Okay. Yeah. And they said that uh, they claimed, oh, this is more realistic. Uh, you know, you. Otherwise, you have to know in advance how many tasks you have, and you have to pre-allocate all this stuff, whereas this is harder, but it's more realistic, according to them. Um, well, it's definitely harder. So, um, And uh, remember, the best you can do on this task is 56.5%. And basically, um, you know, if, you, if you skip to panel D, they found that the same thing, EWC, or SI plus context dependent gating would get you very close to that 56%. I forget what the actual number was, but you can, anyway, you can see it's uh, very close to. Interestingly in this task, um, context de dependent gating by itself worked better than SI or EWC. So if you look at this versus this, you know, this is X, this is the pure context dependent gating without synaptic stabilization. And then this is the, the lower one here is uh, pure synaptic stabilization without any context dependent gating. So here the XDG DG actually did better than pure SI. Okay, so, um, so pretty nice results, pretty impressive results that with this, they were able to pretty much recover all the accuracy on this ImageNet task. And uh, kind of the last thing here, I made a list of kind of some of the issues um, that I had. So overall, I, I really like the paper. I, again, it's very clearly written. I encourage you to read it. If you haven't read it, they explain everything and very logically, uh, and they test a lot of different conditions. Um, so some of the issues I had, um, you know, here you have you have know the task ID ahead of time, um, so that's given to you. Um, you know, it's not like you're learning the context from the input or some other thing. You you you're given the the task ID. Um, the masks are hard coded, like Kevin mentioned. Uh, there's no concept of learning these masks. Um, you know, they didn't explicitly mention this, but the weights are all dense, so there's no sparsity in the weights. This is purely looking at activation sparsity. Um, and I said here, XDG by itself did not help much, but I guess in the ImageNet one, it, it did better. But really this, but the bottom line is this, this they really required synaptic intelligence plus context dependent gating to, to get the best results. Um, I think it's very close to the SuperMass paper. SuperMass paper also, you had, you know, predetermined random masks for every task. Um, although they allowed sort of mixtures of subnetworks, and in Supermass you didn't train the weights themselves, which was kind of one of the unique things about Supermass. But you know, conceptually, it's very it's very close in the space of papers. It's somewhat similar to Atomo because we're doing this uh, multiplying the activations by this uh, by a, a, a context signal. Um, Animal is better because you learn the context signal. Um, through meta learning, but I actually like this paper better because they train the full network, whereas in animal, they only train the output layer. So it's not to me, that's not really continual learning. Here, they're training the full network. 
and they're just using the context signal to determine which parts get trained. Um, you know, we talked about the sparsity percentages. Uh, I thought that was interesting. You know, like they should be able to go much sparser, particularly if they go higher dimensionality. But it's good that they at least looked at it. Um, I thought the tie to there was a bunch of stuff about neuroscience in the beginning, but I thought the tie to neuroscience was a bit loose. You could almost see what a circuit would look like here, a neural, a real neural circuit. And given that this was at some level a neuroscience paper, it would have been nice to see the the neural circuit. But these are these are relatively small nits. Uh, overall, I I really like the paper. So. Okay, any more questions? That's pretty much all I had. Uh, yeah, I have, uh, I guess, first an understanding question. So basically the main difference between condition C and D is that there are overlaps between the uh, neuron populations or is there another significant difference? That's the main difference. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, and it's sort of similar to kind of the point you are making once it's once you have if you don't allow overlaps, um, you know because they're just doing a dumb uh, dividing by the number of tasks. If you have a hundred tasks, you end up with uh, you know 20, 20 neurons for each of those, uh, you know twenty active neurons for each subnetwork. Yeah, so that's it gets very small number of uh, active neurons. Whereas if you allow the allow the, the, the sharing and the redundancy, then you can have, uh, you know, the number of tasks doesn't depend, doesn't determine how many neurons become active. Yeah, I, I, that yeah. actually was another side question I had. So the uh, catastrophic forgetting for condition C was actually a lot weaker than I had expected. So um, they just split it into five sub -net networks, but every network still has to solve um 20 tasks so i was a bit surprised that the accuracy stayed so high compared to um the the baseline of using one network like just dividing it by five uh, um, i would expect I, the accuracy to also just divide by five uh no i think what they did was um so if you look at the the context network here so at this point here they have each task has uh 2000 you know divided by 100 units as associated with it so it would literally be just 20 units for each for okay each and task. there they also yeah. already applied some synaptic intelligence right they're also doing synaptic intelligence uh, okay. but they only have 20 but they only have 20 units for each subnetwork if i understood it correctly it this five okay. over here is just for illustrative purposes it's not really five always ah um, okay that okay. that's that's my under uh, Where's the uh, split network? Okay. No, you're right, actually. No, I, I take that back. You're right. But I guess if it also has it synaptic split intelligence, it into five sub networks. That... Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I take, take back what I said. You were right, uh, Vivian. It literally is okay, five but... networks, and each network has to learn. Yeah, so that is a weird. Okay, so yeah, I have the same confusion yeah. as you. <laughs> I guess it's when they also apply synaptic intelligence. Additionally, maybe that helps a lot. But I guess that brings me to the, my main question, which is those um, plots uh, where they show the synaptic importance and um, mm -hmm. that there's lower importance. Um, yeah, um, do they have this also for the split network? Because that would be interesting if actually um, this effect is coming from the overlap, or if it's just coming from splitting the network. Um, they, I didn't see it for the split network. Because um, in my view, this is like the most interesting point. If the overlap is actually helping um, this kind of learning, because I guess that would be the ultimate goal to. Uh, 
to not just split the resources between the tasks, but actually have like some overlap of the used resources. Yeah. 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 So they don't didn't test that. I I'll have to look at it uh, offline. I, I don't remember seeing that. I'm just quickly trying to read their, you know, their text here, but I don't see it. Yeah, I can also look at it. Yeah, there. yeah. yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons why I was asking about whether they play with the granularity of the splitting. Mm -hmm. Because it, it it's, it's an artificial imposition, but it would be interesting. I mean, it, I think it plays into Vivian's question. How much of it is the granularity of the splitting versus the overlap amongst the partitions, if you wish? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's all, all good questions. Um, yeah, they didn't, they didn't really delve into that stuff as far as I know. Dubitha, can you go back to figure two? So there in uh, in panel C, if I understood correctly based on the discussion right now, um, they are there are five exactly five sub networks, right? So you're, you're dividing, yeah. And, and then so each of them is is only learning um, twenty tasks each. So then I guess a fair comparison point would be um, the final accuracy in panel C versus where the curves get to after twenty tasks in panel D, especially since you're including the context dependent gating. And there it's up at beyond 95%, but there in panel C, it's below 95%. So I guess um, it's not it's not as impressive as it as you'd originally think. Okay, so I you're saying it's, that... sort of, it's sort of this point versus uh, this point here? Um, That's what you're yeah. comparing? Yeah. Because this is the 20. Um... But, but the number of units overall is still the same, right? So you're breaking, breaking it down into five subnetworks, but if I exactly, correctly, yeah. that's the same network. So you have less units per task. So I think it's a fair comparison. Yeah, so what they did in the gating, they gate 80% of the hidden units. So uh, you know, so one fifth of the hidden units are allowed through. Whereas here in this in this in the split network case, they also have exact, you know, they're still only allowing 20% of the units to get through, but there's no redundancy. There's less redundancy. Uh, they both use the same amount of neurons, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that must have been why they did exactly five subnetworks. So they're both using exactly the same number of neurons. Also, Subitai, um, I've been trying to make sense of why in panel D the, the dotted curves are on top of the, the black curve. I think it, it kind of makes sense why they're on top of the just SI or EWC alone, but on top of the yeah. black curve, it seems like it, um, what happens is, you know, you're training each subnetwork on each new task, but now even within that subnetwork, you're constraining some weights and saying weights that have been, that are sort of shared with another task, you're constraining them a little more. And so those are, those are, those are not getting updated so much, but they already have so much capacity in their subnetwork because they have, even when they're at the 87% um, sparsity level, they still have 260 units that they can, they can choose to to train and yeah. so now you're just some of them are just not being trained because they some some of those weights going into some of those units are not being trained because they were used on some other tasks but you still have a bunch of weights still left yeah so, so it sounds like that's so you're like, asking if you're like like why is this one so low uh well not really low why is the other why is the other one so much better i guess that that's what i'm asking so from here up to here <laughs> yeah and i and i guess, and yeah. I guess that, so that, that's how I make sense of it. That you know, you're you're constraining some of the weights within the subnetwork, but then, but then you already have your subnetwork is already so wide because you have two thousand um, hidden units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even in the even in the in all of these cases, uh, you know, you have individual synapses that have to be repurposed to multiple tasks, and so it makes sense that SI or EWC would help in those cases. And, and I guess once you have the context dependent gating, you have much less interference between the different tasks. And so each synapse with both XDG and synaptic intelligence, a given synapse is only used for a small number of tasks, a much smaller number of tasks. Yeah, I, I feel like it, that would be super interesting to know the effect of the overlap because it could be an interesting explanation to say, okay, because there's some overlap, 
the overlap destroys some of the connections. So it actually has to use a very few neurons um, to encode mm -hmm. this class because sometimes through the overlap, there's like mix up between the uh, weights. And that's mm, could be why like um, the synaptic import, the importance distribution is changed like that. Yeah. Uh, because of the ones that were destroyed from the other tasks. I'm not sure. Uh, could be. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Dubitai, also, um, isn't the context dependent gating better than the other um, EWC and synaptic intelligence in the image net case? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Where was that? Yeah. So that was uh, curious. Yeah. I The, the so hypothesis here, that I had. Oh, yeah. yeah sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say the hypothesis, the hypothesis that I had was that with image net, the different tasks are somewhat similar because they're all dealing with natural sort of objects and they're all sort of the same mm. general distribution of natural images. But with permuted MNIST, it's like a totally different task. And even though it's still coming from, you know, the base MNIST data set, when you permute it, all of a sudden, all that structure is lost. So then yes. you can't actually yeah. take advantage of overlaps with permuted MNIST, but you can with ImageNet. Ah, I see. That's an interesting insight. Yeah, with permuted MNIST, everything is like completely almost random. Mm -hmm. um, but with ImageNet, there's a lot of shared structure. Um, and so you can leverage that shared structure across tasks. Is that yeah. division between 100 tasks, is that arbitrary? Or do they use the existing taxonomy in ImageNet? Like there is an existing hierarchy. Do they use that? Or yeah. Just... Um, they did. Uh, OK, that's a good question. Um... I thought we give some. Uh, level of separability between tasks if they actually use the hierarchy. Yeah, they. I think they talked about that a little bit. Uh, okay, so here we divided the data set into 100 sequential tasks, which the first 10 labels of the ImageNet data set were assigned to task one. It just seems it's randomly assigned, right? So. Yeah, but, um, you know, in the, whoops. In the oh, I see. Uh huh. They have the actual uh, actual uh, things here, but I don't know if the ImageNet categories themselves are they're not randomly ordered. There might be some structure in the order because you can look here. You know, if you look there at the first task, it's all hierarchy. about animals. Hmm? Right. There is an existing hierarchy. I just don't know if they use it, but it looks like they use it, right? At least it seems like it looks like here, but uh, but it may be that. ImageNet is already, the task IDs are already set out such that they're sort of semantic. Like they're more likely to be similar if they have the similar index, task index. Oh, I see. But, so, so if you look just at the index, it's already like that. I'm not It might be sure. like that. Yeah, I mean, but, it definitely but if, seems you can, that way. You just, can access the, the, the taxonomy, you can access the hierarchy and you can use it that yeah, to yeah. do it. But this is definitely not random, right? Because uh, if you but, look here, you know, it's all about boats. Um, and then if you look at the first one here, it's all about, you know, oh, they're all animals. Um, you know, so they're, it's definitely not random. Seems yeah, a bit odd to one. put a missile in the same category as a bicycle built for two. <laughs> <laughs> Depends how fast you're biking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but to Alex's point, like e even if we consider there is some separability, like it's very far from what you get in permitted in this case. Yeah, there's yeah. still a lot of a, shared structure. Exactly. So maybe the context dependent gating is is helping there. So I'm like, okay, I don't want to take up. I know we've taken up a lot of time. We should probably stop. Because uh, Alex did. Did we run out of time for you, or do you think you still have time to do yours? Um, I think I think we probably run out of time. I was I was gonna okay. say sorry um, about that. Go well yeah. past lunch. It's okay. I can just present another time. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna stop uh, sharing there.